we're going to go superficial to deep. So let's start with the external obliques. Now, your external obliques, fiber direction, which way does it go? This way, right? The way your fingers would be if you put your hands in your front pockets. So you guys can write external obliques, front pockets. To help you guys out a little bit, how many of you guys look at pictures of bodybuilders and fitness models and you know, you've seen a muscle and fitness magazine or a shape magazine and people get all striated in here, right? You see the lines. Which direction do those lines always go? Right? Because your external obliques are external, right? They're the ones that are most superficial. That's what we're seeing. So if the fiber direction is this way, right? This muscle goes like this. What joint actions is it going to cause? Yeah, which, which rotation is it? If this muscle shortens, what's going to happen to my spine? It's going to rotate this way? Right? If this muscle shortens, it's going to twist me this way, right? Which would be contralateral rotation. So we got external obliques. Contralateral rotation. What else might they do? Okay, so we got, we got the obliquity thing. I told you guys muscles with a diagonal usually do rotation. We got rotation out. There's got to be a couple other things this muscle will do, though. It's going to help with flexion. Right. Because the obliques do lie in front of the lumbar spine, right? This is the joint that they cross. They're in front of it. So external obliques, flexors of the spine? I'm going to say yeah. What else might they do? Lateral flexion. How many of you guys think lateral flexion? Yeah. I mean, how do people try to work their external obliques, AKA their love handles? because they're trying to spot reduce the fat over their external obliques, which absolutely doesn't work. And then they do an exercise, which is kind of ridiculous. We already talked about this yesterday. They do this one, right? We talked about this. Well, your external obliques actually are not your primary lateral flexor of the spine, but do they lie lateral to the spine? Sure, so they'll definitely help a little bit. They'll definitely help. Now, the other thing you have up on that chart there, and this is more just some extra information for you guys. We were talking about connective tissue this morning, right? When you open up a cadaver, you don't see all these pretty red muscles. You see a lot of white connective tissue. That is especially true in this area. The most superficial thing here on your six pack is not your rectus abdominis, but this abdominal connective tissue. And you guys see a little evidence of that because what actually makes the six pack? No, what? You have the linea alba, which is the connective tissue in the middle, and then all of this, these transverse little separations, which are also made of connective tissue. They're probably there because connective tissue with its rigidity and strength probably improve the overall um, strength and ability for the rectus abdominis to prevent what? What don't we want to do with the lumbar spine? Forceful hyperextension, right? So we have a nice, nice bit of connective tissue here to help, help the rectus abdominis do its job. Just reinforce it a bit. I think that's one of the next muscles up here. Yeah, rectus abdominis. This one should be pretty easy for you guys, right? Rectus abdominis runs which way does it fibers run? Up and down. Up and down. So
So it runs up and down in front of the spine. What plane do you think it's probably going to work best in? It's a sagittal plane muscle. Being that it's a sagittal plane muscle and it's in front of the spine, what do we think it's going to do as far as joint actions? Flexion. I always love, every once in a while I get these calls from like a, a writer for like one of the magazines or whatever. And of course, what do they always ask? Abs. What's the best exercise for the? Abs. abs. And of course, what are they talking about when they say abs? External. Rectus abdominis. And my answer is always the same. What's the best exercise for the rectus abdominis? Flexion. Flexion. <laughs> um, do you have anything other than flexion? No. <laughs> it's what the rectus abdominis does. Well, what else could the rectus abdominis do a little bit of? Does anybody know? Like, think about your tilts. You remember your pelvic tilts? Yeah. Right? It'll do this. Isn't this still spinal flexion, though? Yeah, you have to do spinal flexion to posteriorly tilt. So they'll be like, so, so the, the rectus abdominis just does flexion. I was like, yeah. And it'll posteriorly tilt your pelvis. What? What do you mean? Uh, you can do a crunch or you can do a reverse crunch. I guess isometrically you could do a plank. Would anything else really affect the rectus abdominis all that much? No. No, and the truth is when we look at EMG studies, guess what has the highest activity for the rectus abdominis? Crunches, reverse crunches, like those things that actually do the action of. It's really not that complicated, right? What keeps most people from having a six pack? Is it the exercise they chose? It's diet. It's diet. How do you get a six pack? Shut your face, move your glutes, right? <laughs> You want to get that tattooed? That was actually the original title of my first book, and the agents were like, um, you can't have shut your face and move your ass as the title of your book. That's not going to work. And I was like, why not? It's awesome. Um, internal obliques. Internal obliques. So we talked about external obliques being this way, right? Those are the muscles you can see. It's fiber direction, as if you put your hands in your front pockets. Guess which way the internal obliques go? This way. All right. So it's like the direction your fingers would be if you put your hands in your back pockets. You guys cool with that? Internal obliques. So which way, what, what joint actions are we looking at? Rotation, we got the obliquity, we know it's on a diagonal, we know it's probably going to contribute to rotation. You got to tell me ipsilateral, contralateral though. If it's this way, and it's going to shorten, and you guys see how that would shorten? Exactly. Exactly. Ipsilateral. All right. What else might it do? Lateral, fl lateral flexion. Yeah, it's on the side of the it's on the side of the lumbar spine. I'll, I'll say lateral flexion. You guys think this can contribute to a sagittal plane motion? Think it can contribute to flexion or extension? Flexion, why flexion? Because it's still in front of the lumbar spine, right? Yeah, remember, your lumbar spine is way back here. So all these anterior core muscles that we spend so much, that we give so much attention, right, in the popular media, they're pretty much all flexors. Everybody's got this? Frank, 
cover that real quick. Why was that? Why are your uh, external obliques contralaterally? So yeah, so this does get a little confusing, the contralateral versus ipsilateral thing. So if you guys, let's pick two points. Right, these both, both these muscles have pretty broad origins, pretty broad insertions. But let's take the external obliques first since we covered those first. Put one finger on your ASIS, okay? And then put one finger back on your ribs. All right, now try to bring those two fingers closer. Which, which direction did I rotate? I ended up rotating a little bit to the left, right? So that's rotation to the opposite side the muscle is on. Contra means against, right? Against or away. So that's contralateral rotation. Now let's do the same thing with the internal obliques. Let's pick a point. Let's, let's pick this little angle of your ribs here, right? And all of a sudden changes. Let's do that one. Point on your posterior ilium. Now try to bring your fingers closer together. Yeah, you guys see how that works? So now we have a muscle on the right is rotating me which direction? Right. To the right. So that's the same side. That would be ipsilateral. You want to totally freak yourselves out? When I rotate to the left, which oblique am I working? Oh, yeah. Right external oblique, right? But my left internal oblique. Muscles work best in the direction of their fibers. Isn't it kind of true that if I rotate this way, that this external oblique and this internal oblique kind of have the same fiber direction? And then if I go the other way, it's. Transverse abdominis, how many of you guys have heard of this muscle? Definitely a muscle a lot of people talk about. Definitely a muscle of a lot of controversy. But the transverse abdominis is an interesting one. Because what joint action, based on its fiber direction, do you guys think this muscle does? Which is, the fiber direction is, is what? Around. It's transverse, right? Yeah. That's why it's called the transverse abdominis, is its fibers are oriented transversely. Its origin and insertion is basically the thoracolumbar fascia. It's a little different than that in textbooks, but you guys get what I'm saying. It's, the attachment goes from here, it wraps all the way around, and goes right back into here. So when it contracts, what actually happens? It's basically your weight belt, right? You guys remember, like, you guys seen the big guys with, like, the, and they do, they have the big weight belts, and they, like, pull them as tight as they can before they get underneath something, like a squat. That's what this muscle is supposed to do. It's supposed to cinch everything up, which, what that ends up doing is increasing intra-abdominal pressure. it also tightens this piece of fascia back here, right? This thoracolumbar fascia, it pulls it like this, really tight. Is that gonna help stabilize my lumbar spine a little bit too? Yeah, it's like having guy wires on each side just getting pulled really, really tight. So it'll increase stiffness in the thoracolumbar fascia TLF, not to be confused with the TFL, right? We think that these two things together increase the stabilization of the lumbar spine. 
Does that make sense? Now there's some varying opinions on how effective that is, but if you guys want to write down a couple re researchers, there's, I know some of you guys are way into the core. You got Richardson, Hodges, and Hines. So I'm going to put Richardson at all. Then there's another guy named McGill, who has a little different theory. And then another cat named Liebenson. So has yet more research and a different approach. A lot of stuff out there. You guys heard of your multifidae? Yeah? So your multifidae are interesting little muscles. They're fairly deep. And they go from Spinous process to transverse process. Spinous process, transverse process. Spinous, trans, spinous process, transverse process. Very segmentally. They're on the back of the lumbar spine. So what joint actions do you think they do? Extension. Extension, sure. They have an obliquity, so what else might they con contribute to? Rotation. Rotation. So we got extension, rotation, and what we believe that's really important about these muscles, these aren't the big extensors of the lumbar spine, right? These little tiny muscles that you see in those pictures but they have something different than the other extensor we're about to talk about, which is they're segmentally innervated. They cross only a couple segments at a time. So we think they're important for what we call segmental stabilization, which is basically, if you thought of your lumbar spine like Jenga. You guys know the game Jenga? Right, you gotta keep all your bricks stacked up. So if these were the bodies of my lumbar vertebrae, right? I got my five little blocks there. What we think these muscles do is when movement or pathology or dysfunction cause our blocks to be this way, It might be these muscles that aren't doing their job. When movement causes us to do something like that, one of our blocks to move out of place, we think that these muscles doing their job will cause these blocks to do what? Straighten back out again. Does that make sense? So your multifidi basically keep your blocks aligned. You guys ever heard the term segmental stabilization? No? You w that's segmental stabilization. All we're talking about is keeping our blocks stacked up. It's a pretty bad thing, right, if one block slides over the other, starts moving out of place? Instinctively, guys. Do you think that's a good thing? No, probably not. So we think that the multifidi have a big role in this. This is the joint actions they'll help with, but this might be their more important function. Just like when we talked about the rotator cuff, we talked about the rotator cuff doing external rotation, internal rotation, abduction, but what was their important function? Stabilization. Dynamic stabilization of the shoulder, right? Same thing with the multifidi and the TVA. They have an action, but their function stabilize the lumbar spine. 
All right, let's look at another big mover. No. No, so the multifidi are very deep and lie right against the, the facet joints of the lumbar spine. Your TVA actually more or less stops at the thoracolumbar fascia. Your multifidi, there's layers to the thoracolumbar fascia. It lies with sandwiched between a couple of those layers. Does that kind of make sense? I got a bunch of pictures online. If you guys go to those muscular anatomy articles, you look up multifidi, you look up transverse abdominis. I have tons and tons of pictures showing like cross sections and stuff so you get a good idea of where all of this stuff exists relative to something else. The erector spinae. All right, I'm gonna ask a question knowing that I'm probably going to get 12-year-old laughs out of it. What does it mean to erect something? Yeah, to stand it up, right? <laughs> so, if my erector spinae will erect me or stand me back up, and I started down here, what joint action is that for the spine? It's extension. I like the erector spinae. I like the little muscles of the back, the erector spinae, even the multifidi. I just like the way they're shaped. I think they're shaped cool. You know what I'm talking about? Looks like an upside down Christmas tree. All right, so if only this side of the erector spinae contracted, what would happen to my spine? Yeah, it'll contribute just a little bit to lateral flexion. You guys realize how long your erector spinae are, right? Yeah, exactly. So just keep in mind, all the way down to your sacrum, all the way up to your mastoid process, depending on which of the erector spinae muscles we're talking about. Another thing to keep in mind, something once you guys start digging a little deeper into your anatomy, is is there one erector spinae muscle? <coughs> yeah. Is there only one erector spinae muscle? Yeah, there's actually three. And they all do a slightly different thing. So you have your spinalis, your iliocostalis, and your longissimus. You know, at this level, we're okay calling it the erector spinae. Like I said, your next level, once you guys get into graduate school, you start tearing things apart, maybe do some cadaver work, you're gonna start needing to know all of the different erector spinae muscles. How many push-ups per ring? <laughs> I'm going to make you start dancing if it happens yeah. again. Um, you have to dance until you get your ringer to stop. All right, so what do I mean by bilaterally and unilaterally? Great question. So bilaterally means what? Both sides. <laughs> If both sides of my erector spinae fire at the same time, what are they going to do? They're going to pull down on my spine, pull down on my rib cage, and I'm going to do this. But if only one side, unilaterally, right, like unicorn, one horn, right, unilaterally pull down, what's going to happen to my spine? This. But would it be more towards the back, like not completely sideways? Or well, we could see, uh, this is where the layers come in, right? Yeah. If we start dividing out these erector spinae muscles, we'll see that at least one of them will contribute to a little bit to rotation. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the larger erector spinae muscles being your iliocostalis. Usually when you see that word cost, C-O-S-T, costa, costal, right? It has to do with the ribs. 
Ilio costalis is the big erector spinae muscle which goes into the rib cage, and it probably can cause a little bit of that rotation. Yes. Yeah, it kind of looks like a Christmas tree, depending on which one we're talking about. But it'll be like the iliocostalis does this, right? The spinalis just goes from spinous process to spinous process like this. The function of this class, guys, is to, is to get down the joint actions. I'm excited, though, because you guys are starting to ask deeper and deeper questions. But as I kind of mentioned earlier when we were just warming up and going through our Q&A today, this doesn't ever stop. It's one of the exciting things about getting into this field is, like, there are, we keep calling them rabbit holes, right? There are rabbit holes to jump down forever. You find something you're into, you can just keep going. As I mentioned, those, those functional anatomy articles that I have up on my site, I got like six, seven pages of text on one muscle. And then pictures, and videos, and illustrations, and diagrams, and research. Depending on what muscle you talk about, you may have hundreds of research studies to look at. Fun stuff. Quadratus lumborum. How many of you guys have heard of this muscle before? Cool. So this muscle goes from my 12th rib to my posterior ilium. Thing I want you guys to keep in mind though, is this is, isn't a superficial muscle like out here. Right? It's a 12th rib to posterior ilium with some connections into these transverse process, it's actually a very deep muscle, comparatively. Your erector spinae are on top of them. Your latissimus dorsi, transverse abdominis, internal and external oblique, on top of them. So it's fairly deep, it's like just like this. What joint action do you think it's gonna cause? Lateral flexion. Anything else? Where would it have to be to cause extension? It'd have to be here, right? It'd have to be somewhere behind the lumbar, at least on the spinous process, It'd be behind the bodies of the vertebrae. This is right here. No rotation. What would it have to have to do rotation? Some sort of obliquity, come forward a little bit. Yeah, this, is, this is lateral flexion. In fact, your quadratus lumborum is your primary lateral flexor. This exercise? Quadratus lumborum exercise. A little bit of oblique, but quadratus lumborum. Is that still, I mean, that's so important though for stability. Sure, quadratus lumborum is very important for stability. It is one of those muscles we kind of talked about though, like the iliacus, that has a propensity to get Short. tight. If the quadratus lumborum got tight, what is that going to do? It could pull you this way if it's one side. If it pulls on both sides, what's it going to do? Yeah, it could, it could start to compress and give you a little soreness. Eventually contribute to maybe some pain and dysfunction. You guys see how that would work? I'm not, I'm, I totally agree that the quadratus lumborum is important to stabilization. Is this a muscle that I'm going to write down an exercise for in a routine? Probably not. I don't think this is something we have to individually strengthen. And I think targeting it too hard might help contribute to that cycle of this muscle getting a little overactive, a little tight, and contributing to some of that pain, low back pain that we see in so many individuals. This exercise would never give anybody. And not just because it makes people look silly like they're trying to impersonate a weeble wobble. Mm -hmm. I think it contributes to low back pain. Oh, you guys didn't think you'd go a whole hour without doing a graph, did you? Mm -hmm. 
You know what that means, though. We just did, you guys just finished all the muscles for functional anatomy one. Mm -hmm. So the one thing I think I mentioned there, guys, is the TVA. Although it will play a role in all joint actions, it doesn't have a joint action. So th it's not going to end up on this graph. Don't forget about it, though. That's what that little box at the top says. Action plane muscles, exercise that includes that joint action. So this one's a little bit more like the scapular graph we did. What was that? What is it? TVA. TVA. What about? TVA, TVA. TV. TV, transverse. Abdominus? Abdominus. Uh, I'm sorry, did I not define that? TVA? Yeah, TVA is transverse abdominus. Occasionally, you'll see it as TA. What's the problem with that one? Thoracic articulation, blah, blah, blah. Tibialis anterior. Your transverse abdominus, right? Does that make sense? It just wraps around like this. He hasn't hit yet. Yes, exactly. 